Welcome to this edition of Labor Vision. I'm Bob Delaney, Executive Director of the Institute for Labor Studies and Research. Labor Vision, a production of the Institute, focuses on topics of importance to working Rhode Island families. We hope you enjoy this evening's edition. Good evening and welcome to this edition of Labor Vision. I'm Bob Delaney, Executive Director of the Institute for Labor Studies and Research. I'd like to welcome you in particular to this show because we think it's somewhat of a special occasion um, in that we're going to try and show you some segments of speeded up video that we'll talk about a little bit later, but it's mostly because I'd like to welcome Mike Arujo. Mike is the business agent for the International Alliance of Theatrical Stage Employees, or IATSE. And Mike, I think it actually has a bigger name than that, and you can talk about that. Yeah, I, I won't be able to remember it. Not a chance. So it's interesting because to be able to carry on a conversation with somebody who's so well informed about all of those things that take place behind the stage, whether it's a television production mm -hmm. or a theatrical production, something at PPAC, and so I'm really looking forward to this conversation because I think that you have a rich history to bring to the table in a conversation because you're originally from Rhode Island, you spent some time on tour, came back home, and really are being very effective in supporting the growth and the development of the union, supporting the workers within your union, but really helping to inform the rest of us about the work that you do. That's a very <clears throat> generous introduction, so thank you, thank you for that. Um, yeah, IATSE Local 23, um, which is stage employees, we do everything from wardrobe and makeup to rigging to electri uh, electricity to computer programming to show writing um, to stage construction, set construction. Um, we're one of the last true industrial unions where we represent every aspect inside the industry. Well, it's interesting because I remember on a number of occasions, but in particular, Jay Leno's last show. Oh, yeah, that's right. He was very clear mm -hmm. about it being a union show, and he was so supportive and so thankful to the members who were unionized employees that made his show run successfully for so many years. That's right. IA Local 44, Studio Mechanics. They're part of, part of the international. Well, that's pretty cool. Tell yeah. me a little bit about what you've done. You've been in Texas and New York. You're back sure. in Rhode Island. Sure, sure. Um, well, I, uh, I started working in theater when I was a teenager. I went to Hope High School, which had an incredible theater program. It has um, one of the most beautiful theaters in the state. It also has a television production um, uh, component that I took as well. I wanted to be a video mixer. I thought that'd be a great job. Um, and from there, uh, they closed the program when they cut the budgets. And so, in order to keep doing it, I went to work. So at around 16, I decided to work in theater and I moved to New York and I worked at the Delacorte for a little while. And then I came back here for a couple of years and worked uh, at AS220 for a little while. Then I went to Texas and worked at the Live Oak Theater there. I worked at the Berkeley Repertory Theater for a little while and Trinity Rep here, came back here and toured with various musical acts over the years. It's been, a, it's been a good good 25 years of theater. Well, you, you've touched on so many highlights just in hearing that mm -hmm. and, and the thing that enthralls me the most is the conversation about Hope High School. Yep. Because I think in many ways with the cuts that are coming to education, so many people claim that the creativity in education is going away, that right. we're spending so much time on standardized testing, that the art and the craft of teaching and the issues around creativity and problem solving are going mm -hmm. away. And having been a high school teacher for more than 20 years, I can truly appreciate the impact that creativity and those kinds of programs have on developing students and how unfortunate it is, like you say, that you had to move away. Right. No, it, um, my experience at Hope, um, as well as, as the friends of mine who went to classical and central, um, even LaSalle had incredible um, experiences in their theater, in their performing arts programs. For a technician, because uh, not everyone wants to be on stage. Um, for some people, the construction and solving the problem is really where, where your passion lies. And Hope High School provided that in a very real way. The teachers were incredible, um, all the instructors. 
um, the facilities were amazing and they left us to our own devices. They said, if you want to produce, produce. Um, from set construction, where if you're not a carpenter, you'll become one, to hanging lights, if you're afraid of heights, you won't be, um, and to actually learning how to facilitate a process. And that's really what a stagehand does, is that we were the, the technical aspect the thing that makes the end product happen is that otherwise the uh, performer is just a naked person sitting in the dark. Well, it's interesting even when we were talking about the name of the union and, and that's the kind of the International Alliance of Theatrical Stage Employees is the short form of it mm -hmm. because it is such an inclusive union of those right. people who, you know, climb the rigging or steel. Well, you, I've often heard you say if there's a steel worker that's out of work, give yeah, you a give call. Yeah, give us a call. Absolutely. Um, the, there's very few industries that a person can come in with no skills or very few skills and literally just push boxes off a truck and roll them onto a stage um, and get a good, good living out of that and make a real living out of that and be expected to grow at the same time if they choose to. Um, most people start out pushing boxes, um, unloading a truck and pushing a box, and then they hang the lights, they learn to focus the lights, then they learn to circuit, circuit the lights or they learn to run sound and follow signal path or they learn set construction and, and that aspect or they learn rigging or they learn every part of it. Um, and they become really rounded stagehands where there's no hidden part. So you end up from the entire spectrum, from people who have um, very little professional education to, to people who are some of the most talented and technically able people you probably ever meet your life. I mean, we, IATSE as a union, as a total union, affect every aspect of every person's life. When people go home, they turn on TV, and that's a, that's a IATSE production that they're usually watching. When you go to the movies, you're seeing IATSE workers work. When you go to the theater, you're watching the output of IATSE designers, um, construction, and every part of it. We affect every part of your life. Um, we're behind the scenes, but we are your scene. And that's something that's always been really important to me. Um, it's a passionate, wonderful industry, and I love it. Well, uh, you know, I know firsthand from meetings that we've attended together, you know, <clears> how <throat> passionate you are about it and your references, even in this conversation, about the experience that you've had on other states when you mm -hmm. talk about Berkeley or, you know, I've heard you carry on conversations about things that were on at PPAC or things at Trinity and even, you know, in community theater like Second Story Theater. Absolutely. It is absolutely amazing the impact because most people really think it's the people on the stage right. and I don't know what the ratios are but it sounds to me like for every person that's out front there's ten people behind oh, supporting that person. Easily. I mean if you've ever sat through the credits on a movie you know exactly what that looks like. You're watching 20 minutes of, of us, of us working. Um, for a theatrical production, a normal theatrical production, you'll have a live orchestra which is union. Um, You'll have actors who are union, and they'll usually be around 20 of them all together, um, plus understudies. And then you'll have support staff, which are equity. They're also union. Um, there's usually 10 or 15 of them. So you'll have about 50 people who will be working on a production normally. Then there'll be about ch between 10 and 30 stagehands that actually operate the show, and usually between 60 and 100 who actually load, load it in. So the total employment on an average, average Broadway show can be anywhere from... 300 to 500 people for the entire course of the show, which is a lot. That's a significant impact when you think about a state this size um, and a community as small as the theatrical community. That's a tremendous economic impact and skills impact that we have. It's outsized. We, we believe in punching above our weight. Well, it's interesting, and this would probably be the perfect time to jump over to this stop motion video. And I'm sure. kind of excited to see it, you know, because, you know, it's one of those things where you see everything crammed together. Right. We're going to take 20 minutes of video and we're going to put it down right. to three and a half minutes and you're going to see people move doing all the things that they're going to right. have to do. Now, in I, I believe the video was shot over the first day of the Mamma Mia load in. <clears throat> and that's usually a pre rig day. So there's 70 people working, um, 20 electricians maybe 15 audio hands, maybe 20 carpenters, 10 or 15, um, well actually 10 riggers, six up, four down, who work 80 feet above the stage and they actually physically lift the stage with ropes. They pull the points that, that pull the scenery in. 
Um, and then you'll have four or five flymen that do the, the gallery, which is what the pipes are that all the drapes are hang, hung on. Um, and it's very, it, it's a, it seems chaotic when you first see it. When you see the first truck pull up, you'll see the gangs run in, um, grab the ramps and start pulling stuff off, and you'll see boxes rolling everywhere. Then you'll see ropes falling from the sky. But every, every roll um, that's there is very carefully designed, and it's really like a elaborate and really kind of beautifully made ballet of, of skill and people practicing their trades. And it's so remarkable to think that one truck can produce this impact, one rigger can produce this impact, and you think that all together, how much stronger this is. Um, it's, it's a point of pride to be able to bring the shows in that quickly with no injury and with laughter. I mean, the thing in the, the video that you don't get, unfortunately, is that you can't hear the sound of the people working, because usually you hear every crew laughing, making jokes, and singing. I mean, it's really, it's a really pretty remarkable thing. And they'll work usually 12 or 14 hours in a single shot. That night, I think they got to three in the morning. They came in at eight the next day, finished the load in for a show that night at five. So well, let's skip to the video. You okay. and I will keep on talking. Sure. Because I think one of the things that's really important is that, you know, for a long, a long time over the last several years, after the last 15 years, they talked about something in manufacturing called lean manufacturing, making sure things were in the right place oh, sure. for the least number of steps. And this is the epitome of lean manufacturing. Absolutely. Every box has a place to be. Everybody knows where the box well, is. Everybody knows what's in it. That's right. And it comes out and it goes back the same way. There's a great anecdote, if we have time for it, about um, D-Day that involves stagehands and uh, the Ringling Brothers, stagehands in particular, is if you ever watched the old way that the army loaded trucks, they would load tanks from the very end of a train and then drive them to the front. So in order to get your load off, you would have to wait until the, each car was empty and then you would get to your load. Um, stagehands unload every truck simultaneously, is that you open the sides and you pull everything out. And supposedly Eisenhower, during a USO tour, watched the Ringling Brothers load and unload the stagehands and the roustabouts load and unload a show and said, that's how we need to do it. And so then the army switched to that method and hired um, stagehands to actually run the initial loading and scenic work of the uh, invasion of D-Day. So stagehands saved the world that day. You're really passionate about this I thing. Care I care deeply. I can really it. tell, yeah. you know, and it's like, so it, when, when people are looking at this thing actually happening, and most times it's like people just running all over the place mm -hmm. because we've speeded up time here. Tell me what they're doing, because you talked about, you gave titles to these people. Tell me sure. who, who sure. we're seeing. The first, the first crew you'll see is a, a load gang, which will get onto a truck and they grab a ramp, um, and then you'll get loaders or pushers who take the boxes and they deliver them to the, the precise spot that they need to be in. So if there's a front of house box, which means the box that goes into the audience, which will be an audio box, the pushes will take that box off, contact an audio person, and then they will walk it to their position, unload it, and then they will go back. And then the electricians will take each section, stage left and stage right, there are two different gangs, upstage and downstage, and they will divide each box working downstage to up, so that way they close off the door at the very end. The carpenters are usually the last group that you'll, you'll see um, coming in, laying the floor, because you need to have nice flat surfaces for all the boxes to roll. So the order of loading um, is uh, the, the key. So the boss loader, or the head carpenter, who at PPAC is actually the president of the union, Billy, Ram, Billy um, Brackett, is so expert and so adept at this that he knows practically by instinct, by the sound of where, which box is coming off the truck, where that box needs to go. Like if it sounds heavy, he knows that's probably audio, and that means it probably has to go down left or down right. Or if it sounds rattling, then he knows it's probably lights, in which case it has to wait for a pipe and a flyman, so we'll put those crews together. Riggers go up during that process and they'll drop the ropes in and they'll pull chain motors up which are usually one or two ton motors they weigh about 80 or 90 pounds each um, it's just the chain and then the motor body weighs about 50 pounds and they'll physically lift each one of those motors up into the the grid um, 
So these are the motors that literally lift scenes from the that, stage right. to the ceiling and drop them up and down. Right, and they drop them up and down. And so the and there's usually the crew of six riggers that were on Mamma Mia, who are again some of the best riggers in the industry, um, considering that this style of rigging was invented in Rhode Island, um, are some of the fastest and safest that have ever lived, and it's it's a point of pride to work with them. Um, they can pull usually 15 or 20 points in about an hour, which when you think about physically lifting that over and over again, is a pretty impressive, impressive feat. So now all of those people that you're talking about, mm -hmm. they live here in Rhode Island, they stay For the most here. part, about- It's um, not like the riggers and the flyers travel no, with- No, no, I mean, we do, we're itinerant a lot because the, in order to really maintain a living, you have to travel a little bit. Okay. But usually we try to stay within 50 miles. Um, yeah. The vast majority of workers in IATSE that work with the union live in state. And most of them live within 10 miles of the venues, as it turns out, which is kind of an interesting thing. So it's probably Providence County. It's interesting because I know at the Institute, we spend a lot of time on a pathway to apprenticeship mm -hmm. training program. And you and I have had some conversations and as we progress in the program, we're gonna be sending students and young adults the opportunity just to see what you do every day. Mm -hmm. Because I think that one of the things that are interesting, it's not any one thing. This is kind of an on the job learning opportunity right. where somewhere in that path of whole variety of skills and technical skills and talents somebody will find what they really like and it could be something as clean as mixing in terms mm -hmm. of sitting behind and working with technology something as rigorous as a rigor mm -hmm. climbing or even the set design and building the sets it's right. just amazing absolutely um the there's just about every discipline and profession is represented um so if a person's interested and they're not sure where they're interested, if they watch long enough, and if they ask enough questions, they'll find a place that they fit. I mean, the rule in IATSE has always been, if you want to work, there's a place for you. Um, I don't think anyone's ever been turned away for lack of skill or lack of knowledge, that there's always a way to grow, and there's always room in the union to grow. Um, we maintain a very high standard, but we don't expect anyone to walk in. Um, no one does, nobody is born an expert. How long, how long does, it, does it really take for an individual to work with IATSE and kind of say, this is what I think I really want to focus on? Some people know immediately. I mean, uh, we've hired people or brought people in as um, reinforcement and they know when they walk in that this is what they want to do. And then there are other people who might be comfortable working one job and may not really want to explore. If you want to be expert and you really want to believe that you're an expert at the job, I think you have to be kind of resigned to the knowledge that you're never going to actually really be an expert because it's changing so quickly that you can never really learn everything. Yeah. And that's kind of part of the joy of it. So it's a lifetime. It's a lifetime of learning. Let me jump to something different. Tell me a little bit about you. Oh, me? Yeah. Uh, I don't know what to say about me. <laughs> what do you want me to say? We've had me? some conversations. I think you've had, uh, you have a pretty rich history yourself, your dad. Well, my dad, my dad um, was uh, George Arujo, who was a lightweight contender from Fox Point in 1951. He was the first African American in the Peace Corps. Um, he was the Army boxing coach in 1952. Painter. Um, he was a proud member of SEIU when he worked at Brown. Um, his grandfather was a founder of the Longshoremen's Union. And my uncle Mikey, I believe, is still on strike for the machinists. Yeah. 
Yeah. Well, you, there's no doubt you have a strong, rich union history. Oh, I know, very proud of it. Very, and, very uh, proud of it. So, which is good. I think you bring a lot to the table personally. Yes, it's fragile. amazing the skills that you have. But one of the things that's even brighter is your encouragement for people to get involved, your encouragement for people to go to the union. Right. Tell me your job as a business agent. Well, you know, we're, the business agent job is we're supposed, we serve the members. It's, it's, we're elected to, to serve their needs and to make sure that they have work. Um, so literally, I will go out if I see somebody hanging a light, be like, who's hiring you and how come you're not working under contract? And, um, it's also to make sure that the quality of our life is good. Um, stagehands, because of the nature of our work, we get people who are uh, recently released from prison often or who come um, in recovery, a lot of, of that. Um, so making sure that they're not facing employment discrimination is part of my job. You, you pay a debt in order to move past it. Um, everyone makes mistakes. Nobody should be judged by their worst day or their best day. And there has to be a place for everybody. It's very important that everyone who works and who wants to work has a job. I believe that's a right. Moving to this international union, and I don't think many people realize the vastness of organized labor in terms of the international crossover, the ability for people to, who are unemployed here, mm -hmm. not just, just to drive across the United States to find a job, but to go into Canada and vice versa. Absolutely, absolutely. It's, it's, I mean, the, what a union, the role of a union is to, one, protect the industry and protect the trade, but also, most importantly, to protect the worker and provide access. The first person that someone should be calling when they're traveling and when they're looking for expansion or if they need a change in their life is they should be calling a union that they're interested in, in the trade that they're interested in. Um, I would encourage everyone to call IATSE because we cover everybody. But obviously, if somebody really feels strongly about learning to be a pipe fitter, they should be calling the pipe fitters. If someone wants to learn to be an electrician, they should be going through the union. Um, if, if unemployed people if all unemployed people did that and started to hold us to task, we could see not only a dramatic change in our conditions, but we could also see the treatment of workers and the treatment of unemployed workers in a much more dignified and reasonable way than we do now. People should not be afraid to cross borders and people should not be afraid to ask. Well, thanks, Mike. I truly appreciate you. I appreciate the, the, the contributions you have made to your union, the contributions okay. that you have made to the performing arts in Rhode Island, you and IATSE. Um, and our guest this evening has been Mike Arujo. Mike is the business agent for Local 23 for the International Alliance of Theatrical Stage Employees. Mike, it's been a pleasure talking with you. you. I hope people enjoy the show and I hope they enjoy that crunch of what yeah. you describe no, as the work that you should do be fun. each day. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Thank you. and move right to the next speaker who is Gina Russo. Is Gina here? Gina is the uh, president of the Station Fire Memorial Foundation, which again, I, uh, is working with the Rhode Island Building Trades to uh, build a memorial at the scene of the Station Fire. And Mike uh, Sabatoni has been working with her and uh, felt it would be important for her have an opportunity to speak to the whole labor movement about uh, what she's doing. Welcome. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, so I guess I should let you know I am a union member. Um, I'm a local 251 for about 20 plus years now. And honestly, I have my job at Rhode Island Hospital because they saved it for three years after the station fire. So proud of them, proud to be a teamster. Um, so I am a survivor of the station nightclub fire. I'm burned over 40% of my body, spent about 11 weeks in a medically induced coma. When I woke up at Mass General Hospital, I started at Shriners Children's Hospital in Boston, made my way over eventually to Mass General, and then finished its balding rehab. After four and a half months, realizing that life was completely different, a fiance died, he never made it out of the building. There was a reason why I was still alive. 
and I could either sink <laughs> and not make anything out of this new life I was given, or I could rise above it. And I chose to rise above for the two little boys that I had to raise, who are now grown men and doing incredible. But one of the promises that I made 10 years ago was to build a memorial so that our 100 angels who passed away on February 20th, 2003, would be honored and that their families would have a beautiful place to go to. With the help of many great people in Rhode Island, um, Mike Sabatoni, I can't even thank you enough. <laughs> you, um, you brought us all together, Gilbane Construction, Building and Trades. We are honored that you care so much about all of us and our 100 angels. But it's a mission. Um, two and a half years ago, when I went on to the board of the Station Fire Memorial Foundation, I went on as the secretary. A year later, Mr. Raymond Villanova, who owned the land, heard me on one of those talk radio shows you mentioned earlier, the Dan York Show, um, talking about how I respected him and wanted to welcome him into our world. He, at that point, was not ready to turn over the land. He hadn't trusted anybody, but he heard me speaking. And speaking loudly enough that he called a few days later, had his attorney get in touch with us, and the land was ours. I was incredibly proud of that. I'm glad to be a part of that, because it meant that part of my promise was being fulfilled, that we now owned the land. It was safe. It was ours. But now we had to build it. And we have a lot of money to raise, a lot of work to do. But I'm on it. I promised my friends that have survived this fire and our 100 angels and their families that I will always continue this mission. But we can't do it alone. We have the help of Gilbane and the building and trades. We wouldn't be where we are at this moment. Our design is done. It's absolutely beautiful. We are ready to start working. They're working on little preparations of the land in the next week or two, and then hopefully we'll be able to start actual construction. But again, we can't do that without people's help. So with all of the unions that are sitting out there today, if any of you think you have something that would help us get on that road to building this beautiful memorial, come see me, talk to Mike. We could use everybody's help. help. This was a state tragedy. I guarantee everyone in this room knew or heard of someone who died in that fire that night or has a friend who was a survivor. Guarantee it. You can't go anywhere in Rhode Island without knowing someone or even in Massachusetts without knowing someone. So please consider helping. Um, whether it's your time, whatever it may be, it's an incredible cause just to say you're a part of it to honor these 100 beautiful, incredible people who passed away and to show the world that Rhode Island came together, that we rose above this tragedy and built this beautiful park for our angels. I want to thank Mike and the organization for inviting me here today. If anyone has any questions, if they'd like to talk to me, I'll be hanging out in the back. But thank you all for, for letting me come here tonight and take up some of your time. Enjoy the rest of the night. Thank you. Thank you, Gina, for your courage and your dedication. And I, I can assure you that you will have uh, a lot of friends and that uh, we will uh, be with you to help you uh, achieve this goal in memory of the angels. Thank you for joining us for this edition of Labor Vision. We appreciate your input and encourage your comments. Labor Vision can be seen on this channel three times each week, Tuesday at 7 p.m., Thursday at 8 p.m., and Saturday at 5 p.m.
Thank you for joining us for this edition of Labor Vision, where we bring the General Assembly right into your living room. My name is James Parisi. I'm a field rep with the Rhode Island Federation of Teachers and Health Professionals, and I'm your host this evening. Today we continue our discussion of legislative issues, and we're going to tackle something a little more esoteric than other issues that we've dealt with on Labor Vision, and we're going to be talking about the Constitutional Convention. I'm pleased to have Paula Hodges with us today as our guest. Paula, thank you for joining us for this edition of Labor Vision. Thanks for having me, Jim. So we've worked together. Um, you're with Planned Parenthood. I'm, I'm with the labor movement and other community groups uh, to work on this constitutional convention issue. But before we get into the ConCon, um, tell us uh, what you do for Planned Parenthood. Sure, happy to. Um, I'm the Governmental Relations Director for Planned Parenthood of Southern New England here in Rhode Island. So I um, oversee all of our public affairs and outreach work. I oversee a community organizer. Um, I lobby in the legislature um, against bad bills and to promote a good coalition package. I also help coordinate elections work um, to help elect supportive state elected officials. We have um, a lot of coalition partners at the Reproductive Justice Coalition and we work to engage youth and um, college students as well around reproductive justice issues. Do you deal uh, just with Rhode Island when you do your legislative work, or you, you spend some time in Mass as well? Uh, I am solely um, dedicated to Rhode Island. We've got our hands full <laughs> here. Um, but Planned Parenthood of Southern New England actually encapsulates Connecticut and Rhode Island. We have 18 health centers between our two states. Um, we serve over 70,000 patients annually between the two states, and we have one health center in, Connect in Rhode Island um, on Point Street. So how long have you been with Planned Parenthood? I am, I am approaching my two and a half year <laughs> anniversary here in the Ocean State. Mm -hmm. um, I started um, right before the holidays in 2011 and have really enjoyed my tenure here. I moved here from Missouri for the position. So um, I debunked the theory that young people don't come to Rhode Island to find their careers. I've been very happy in my work here. And what did you do before you worked for Planned Parenthood? I was the political director for Missouri NEA, the um, National Education Association in Missouri, and worked in Jefferson City um, in that state capital. We call it a capital, not a state house. Um, that was my first lesson when I moved to Rhode Island. Um, and did um, a lot of political coordination, especially around school board elections, because in Missouri, collective bargaining is, um, is left to the school districts to determine. So you have to elect supportive um, school board committees in order to have collective bargaining agreements. So you've always worked on the intersection of legislation as well as politics. Yeah, that's become my niche. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's definitely um, an exciting um, field to work in. Mm -hmm. So now let's talk about the Constitutional Convention. First of all, what is a Constitutional Convention and why should our viewers even care about the issue? That is an excellent question. Mm -hmm. um, being from Missouri, I had a um, somewhat of familiarity with Constitutional Conventions. Um, about 13 states, aside from Rhode Island, um, have a constitutional requirement to go to the ballot ever so often. In the case of Rhode Island, every 10 years, a question gets put before the voters to ask, should there be a constitutional convention? And if the voters say yes, it sets in motion a series of processes um, by which a special set of delegates based on House districts get elected. So this issue of whether or not we want a constitutional convention is already going to be on the ballot. Yes. So in 2014, um, it, it could appear on the ballot in one of two ways. The legislature could pass a motion to send it to the ballot in November to appear in the general election, or the Secretary of State could put it onto the ballot. And I believe um, the Secretary of State has already committed to saying he would put it on the ballot. So we're planning as though it will appear on the November 2014 ballot. So what um, the issues that um, we care about, mm -hmm. that uh, community partners care about, labor unions would care about, um, even come up in something called the Constitutional Convention? Absolutely. Um, we should all care very much about the implications of a Constitutional Convention. The last time a state called for one was actually Rhode Island in 1984. They voted to have one, and the, the Constitutional Convention met in, 20, in 1986. Um, and it set in motion a very um, convoluted process that ended up being what I would call um, a politician's convention. 
um, in which um, so at the time 100 delegates had to be elected in a special election that was very low turnout in order to go to Providence and make really important decisions about constitutional amendments that would have a deep impact on our governmental systems and processes here. So there were 100 delegates back in 86 because mm -hmm. there were 100 representative districts. Mm -hmm. So if it passed now, we have 75 representative exactly. districts. Is that how many delegates we'd have? Exactly. We would have 75 delegates based on our House apportionment, and anybody could run. So past lawmakers, current lawmakers, lobbyists, family members of elected officials could run. In 1986, there were seven former lawmakers who ran, and I believe four or five family members of lawmakers, including the speakers kids at the time. So um, based on our past knowledge of what's happened during these constitutional conventions, um, although one might say it's an alternative to the legislative process, we believe that the same actors who are involved in lobbying um, and impacting public policy in the legislature would very much have a high and heavy influence on the constitutional convention. So as we sit here today, we've just had a, a speaker whose office has been um, searched and we're undergoing a change in leadership on the House. So there might be people who would argue that there's some things wrong with government. We maybe need to change certain things. Um, don't you need a constitutional convention to change how we, how we govern here in Rhode Island? We understand and hear the, the fact that people are unhappy with their elected officials and politicians. and believe that um, the regular elections process through which we elect our state legislators and governor, statewide elected officials, um, could work better if more people were involved and more people ran. Um, the problem with the Constitutional Convention, frankly, is you're dealing with um, special elections that may occur in the spring. Uh, unclear, um, that would be up to the governor, I believe, to make that determination. Would involve very low turnout elections, a lot of confusion about the purpose, and these um, delegates would not be held accountable to being reelected. They go in, they have um, their convention, and then they're done. They can wash their hands of it. So the accountability that we believe we have over our current legislature doesn't even exist for the Constitutional Convention. I imagine some special interests with deep pockets could have a whole lot of influence over who's elected delegate in a small state like Rhode Island with just a million people. Absolutely. Um, my background in Missouri was working against ballot initiatives and we, we saw um, untold millions of dollars coming in to fight citizen um, or to promote um, what are called voter initiatives. Um, this, the Constitutional Convention would be kind of like um, a voter initiative process but on steroids in that they are unlimited in what kinds of topics they can take up. So in 1986, unfortunately, um, reproductive health and abortion were at the heart of the convention, and they tr attempted to put one of the first personhood amendments in the country on the, the ballot, and they did. They put it on the ballot, and the voters voted it down two to one after a very intensive campaign. What we know and what we're seeing in other states where um, there are voter initiatives um, we're seeing um, minorities and women really being negatively impacted through these processes, and we believe that any out-of-state interest or in-state interest that has hundreds of thousands of dollars laying around could influence to get constitutional amendments put on the ballot, um, especially in, in light of Citizens United, the Supreme Court decision that said corporations are people and they can spend an unlimited amount of money to influence elections. I just um, believe that uh, the Constitutional Convention is a great risk for our civil liberties, for reproductive rights, for labor, certainly collective bargaining rights, um, and a whole slew of other social issues. I know the labor movement has seen in recent years in states that have voter initiative, ballot initiatives that deal with right to work, uh, mm -hmm. ballot initiatives that deal with um, paycheck deception and whether or not you can even have dues deduction if you work in the public sector. There's all yep. sorts of threats to worker rights in, in ballot initiative states. Is that important uh, when you think about whether or not we want a constitutional convention here in Rhode Island? Absolutely. I think um, you know some people will say, well, this isn't the same as voter initiative. No, it's not. But once you convene a convention, you can't limit what they're going to put on the ballot. And frankly, um, if I were an out-of-state special interest who wanted to pass right to work or paycheck deception, 
it would be a pretty good bargain for me to come in, influence 35, 40 delicate, delegate elections, get people into a convention, and then get these constitutional amendments out there in one fail swoop. Um, it's, uh, it is a, a very um, discerning process, I think, and a, a lot of people assume that good, spirited government reformers are gonna run for these seats and win, and what we know is um, politicians who are expert at running elections will be the ones with the upper hand in running for these delegate seats, and um, having the backing of special interest will, will certainly sway what topics they take up in our convention. So. so any kind of government reform can come out of a constitutional convention. Say I'm a person who wishes there was a more accountable assembly by going back to two-year terms, mm -hmm. uh, you, know, um, you know, for all office holders and, you know, instead of just the assembly members or, or, or something along those lines. What, uh, what means can someone who wants to change how our, our government works um, make those kinds of changes without a constitutional convention? Yeah, I think there's a lot, of, um, a, a lot of confusion about how we can affect change in um, transparency in government. The, the, the number one way we can affect change is to elect a, um, pr progressive and supportive state legislators, House members and Senate members, and a governor. And um, actually, in recent years, when the state of Rhode Island has done some good government reforms, like shrinking the size of the state house from 100 to 75 and changing the term limits from two to four years for statewide office holders, that was done through legislative process. So where we can be heard on the ground in lawmakers' districts, they have the ability to do the right thing and make these um, reforms. And we can do that every year when we're in the state house. It doesn't have to wait for this decennial process. So the General Assembly can put things on the ballot yes. and we can change our constitution that way. And in fact, the recent years of the Rhode Island General Assembly says they're amenable to changing our constitution. We've done it a few times, yeah, haven't we? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So um, we, we certainly hope that that's the track we can take to make things better in the ocean state. Um, again, having a constitutional convention can open up a really ugly can of worms. It's a costly process. Um, it's for the state to have to fund this additional convention, but it also will become a very costly process for our constituents, for women, for union members, retirees. Um, it, it, it's, it's a Pandora's box that we haven't seen open since 1986, and there's a reason for that, and there's a reason why there have been 26 statewide votes taken in other parts of the country where voters said no to this idea because they understood how dangerous this was. So the last constitutional convention in a state was in Rhode Island back in 86? Yes, yep. Something to be said for uh, stability, I, I imagine. <laughs> Guess so, <laughs> I suppose. So. Your organization has your set of issues. I know the labor movement has some serious reservations about the threats to worker rights mm -hmm. with the Constitutional Convention. What, what kinds of organization, other organizations are you seeing uh, coming together to raise concerns about a Constitutional Convention? Certainly, there are a lot of advocacy, nonprofit advocacy groups who are thinking around the clock about um, the Pandora's box of winding back the clock on civil rights, on women's rights, minority rights. So we're, we're reaching out to our brothers and sisters in the labor community, to civil liberties groups like the ACLU. We're certainly um, talking with other um, advocate groups that care about um, advancing immigration reform, um, looking at progressive revenues for the state so that working families aren't constantly taking it on the chin when the economy's not improving here. So we believe this issue, the Constitutional Convention, affects everybody, seniors, young people, uh, minorities. What we see time and time again in states that have voter initiative or send um, amendments to the ballot, they hurt those who are most vulnerable, so people who are already underrepresented, low-income, minority, women workers, um, who may not have access um, to what they need in our current system, let alone after some uh, really radical right ballot initiative comes through that tries to defray health care reform or immigration reform. Um, so that's who we're, we're talking to, anybody and everybody we can, and we think at the end of the day there will be a broad coalition of diverse voices that will stand up against this. 
And I, when I think about what happened just last year in terms of the biggest bill that passed the assembly was the marriage equality bill. Could something like that get undone at a constitutional convention? Absolutely. Um, that should be front of mind for most people. I know that probably seems like ages ago when we passed marriage equality, um, not quite a year ago. Um, but absolutely for folks who didn't want to see that come to pass, they could easily um, attempt to roll back um, equal rights for LGBTQ communities in the same way that they could attempt to put measures on the ballot that would affect minimum wage, affect access to health care, especially reproductive rights. We see it time and time again in states like Mississippi and Colorado. I know that many Rhode Islanders feel like, well, we're not Mississippi or Colorado, but the same outside players can come in and do exactly what they're doing in those states right here. So if you're concerned about civil rights, worker rights, reproductive rights, whatever thing you want to protect, what's the best way to stop a constitutional convention from happening in the first place? It's a great question. Um, hopefully, if you are um, you are a union member or you're a member of one of our organizations, supporter of a community group, get involved. Um, make your voice heard. Contact your lawmaker and make your voice heard. But certainly vote on, on November 4th um, against the constitutional convention question and talk to your friends about it. Um, you'll be hearing more about our work, I think, in the coming months um, to educate the public and educate our elected officials about why this is um, a high stakes game that we just can't afford to lose. I've got to imagine it's going to be a challenge getting voters' attention focused on an issue like constitutional convention when we're going to have a very active race for our governor, we're going to have a very active set of general assembly races. You know, how do you focus uh, attention on, on, on an issue like a government reform process when you have all these other things going on in Rhode Island politics? That's always the challenge, staying focused and um, having a consistent message. To your point of it being a busy cycle with the gubernatorial race, no doubt we've seen that already. Um, in the last three to six months, um, everybody's focused on who's, who's next. Um, what I would say um, about our organizations and community being focused on defeating a constitutional convention is the long-lasting impact of a con-con gone awry has a much deeper impact than perhaps one gubernatorial administration. So um, we know that altering our state constitution to roll back rights could have a far larger unilateral impact than just one gubernatorial race. However, it's important that all the candidates who are running this year um, and incumbent lawmakers understand what's at stake with the Constitutional Convention, and we hope to talk about that with them over the course of the next eight months of this campaign. I can imagine there are some people who, even though they understand the concern, they still see some opportunity. and. Um, Quite frankly, when, um, when I was asked about this issue um, back in the fall, I said, I'm opposed to a constitutional convention, but if it passes, I'm running. You know, as a union member in Johnston in District 43, I intend to be on the ballot. Um, isn't that an expensive way to protect your rights? You know, uh, pay, you know going through a, a, a ballot question and then running delegates and then having to deal with uh, with what happens at the convention. It could be good or bad, but it's certainly going to be expensive either way to preserve yes. what you've got. There's certainly going to be a cost to the state to put it on and a cost for you know individuals to run. And if, I mean, I would say that if we had um, a high bench of individuals who are wanting to run for office, we, we might be doing a better job in getting those folks to run for state legislature. Um, that um, getting, recruiting people to run for to be delegates will be challenging. But to your point, if we were to lose and a constitutional convention process is set in motion for the first time in over 30 years, um, we would certainly be encouraging all of our supporters in every, in every district to run um, to, to attempt to um, make sure that the outcome is positive for um, worker rights and women. Um, but let's hope, let's take it one step at a time. Let's hope we don't get there quite yet. <laughs> Paul, I appreciate your, you coming into the studio and educating our viewers on this really important constitutional issue. Thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you for joining us for this edition of Labor Vision, where we bring the assembly right into your living room. Well, we got a lot to do, so we got to keep fighting.
And um, I've just got a, just a few comments before we, we move along. I don't think it would be, I don't think it'd be appropriate if I didn't say a few things, but um, just have a few concepts to throw out at you. One is that we have to use our economic power in a much greater way than we do now. And what I mean by that is what we did here tonight. We have an event at a union facility that keeps union members working. You gotta pay your bills by mail. Don't use an ATM machine. Go to the Rhode Island Credit Union. Don't use a checkout, the automatic checkout in the supermarket. Keep somebody working. If you have a union office, have the trash removal in the office cleaned by union members. Make sure your printing's all union. Think of the economic power we have. A hundred thousand union members and their families. What if each one of us spent a thousand, moved a thousand dollars to unions, goods and services instead of non-union? That's a hundred million dollars into the Rhode Island economy to build up the labor movement. We have to think, use our power. We can keep our own members working and we can grow our membership that way. Another thing, just a pet peeve. Have you ever been pissed off when they call us a special interest? I mean, that just drives me crazy. Special interest, look at our agenda. Look what we fight for. Look who we fight for, not just our own members. The minimum wage, workers' compensation, the job that Armand did. Back in 1990, we have the best workers' compensation in the city. That helps union and non-union members. Unemployment insurance, TDI, education, health care, the bond issues that we work for. We're not a special interest. So I would ask you to do one thing. The next time someone says that, say, no, we're not a special interest. We're the people's lobby. That's what we have to get the message across. We are the people's lobby. We can no longer allow ourselves to be called a special interest. We know what the special interests are. They're the people who wanted this country shut down just recently. They're the banks, the insurance companies, the financial institutions. They care about just a small thing. How much more profit can they make? We are the people's lobby. We are no longer ever going to be called a special interest. And that's what our vow is to leave here tonight with. The other thing, and we say it all the time, but we have to remind ourselves about it. There is no middle class without the American labor movement. As we go, so does the vast majority of working people in our country, and we have to remind people of that. If we don't have a strong labor movement, we'll get, this country will go to hell in a handbasket, and it's heading in that direction. We gotta rebuild the labor movement because that's the only way we're gonna have and maintain the middle class. I just wanna say one thing about power. That's a word that a lot of people are afraid of. And they say we have too much power. Well, we know we don't because we live it every day. We see our members under attack. We see people losing benefits. We see what we have to do to maintain benefits. We do not have enough power. But I'll tell you, when we are gonna have enough power and we, when we realize our power, and that is when every single worker has a good job, with a good wage, with a good pension, with good health and welfare benefits, a safe and healthy workforce, dignity and respect, and a voice on the job. When we get to that point, we'll stand up and say, yes, we have the power that we should because it's for everybody. And the other thing sometimes we forget is we're in a fight every day. We're different than a lot of groups. We are the only group left, in some cases, that can stand up to the concentration of wealth and power in this country. And it's our obligation to fight. And we're always going to be in a fight and a struggle, but it's for a righteous cause. Because we're not committed to the status quo. The easiest thing to do is just say, hey, everything's fine. Leave it alone. But if you don't think everything's fine and you think things have to change, then we have to be in a fight. And if we're in a fight, sometimes it's not, it's not an easy thing to do to have everyone kind of yelling at you all the time and telling you you're nuts and crazy and just leave everything alone. 
I just want to leave with a, a quote from Frederick Douglass, who was an abolitionist. And he kind of put it into perspective. Power concedes nothing without a demand. It never did and it never will. Find out just what any people will quietly submit to and you have found out the exact measure of injustice and wrong which will be imposed upon them. And they will continue till they are restrained with either words or blows or both. The limits of tyrants are prescribed by the endurance of, the, of those whom they oppress. That's the battle that we're still in. So we have to fight. That's our obligation. We owe it to those who came before us. We owe it to those that are going to follow us. We have an obligation to get up every morning and fight for our members and fight for the workers of this country and this state. And Steve hit the nail on the head about staying united. Now over the next year, there's going to be a lot of people coming to knock on your doors. And they're going to be seeking our support and they're going to make promises. They're going to be with us all the time. We know from experience that's not always the case. We're a federation and the affiliates are independent to make their own choices. But it's always better for us to be united. And it doesn't happen unless we work at it. So I would request as we go forward over the next year, that when we make these decisions and these considerations, we pledge to each other in this room, no matter what union that we're from, we pledge to each other that no political leader should ever be allowed to divide us. Though attempts have been made in the past, to do that to the American labor movement, whether it's by race, by ethnic groups, by gender, by sexual orientation, those have been resisted and opposed. Today, the flavor of the day is to divide us by the public sector versus the private sector. And we have an obligation to say, no, that doesn't happen in Rhode Island. A divided labor movement is a weakened labor movement. We cannot let it happen. That's our obligation to each other here. Some people are subtle about it, and some are more open, like the governor of New Jersey, who recently proudly said he's, gonna, he's been able to divide the labor movement between the public sector and the private sector. So let's us, in this room again, say we are united, as brothers and sisters, we're committed to a strong and a vibrant economy in Rhode Island, and we only get there when we are united. Thank you again for your vote of confidence, and I pledge to do that. Revision can be seen on this channel three times each week, Tuesday at 7 p.m., Thursday at 8 p.m., and Saturday at 5 p.m.